Welcome back. So we have been looking at recurrence relations. So we have seen recurrence relations for some time now. So it is basically a sequence of numbers that have been defined recursively. And recurrence relations are useful for uh, various other topics in math and computer science. Now, uh, in the topics related to recurrence relations, we have seen that how recurrence relations can be used to model problems and also we have seen how one can solve recurrence relations. We have seen some techniques for that. So, there were a few examples that we have looked at already. I don't want to go over it all over again. And the question is, how can we solve this recurrence relation? The thing that we saw is that one of the techniques of solving it is first guess a solution and then prove by induction. Now, the idea is that if we can correctly guess the solution, then proving by induction is a reasonably straightforward thing. But how do we guess the solution correctly? Now here also we saw a few examples and we saw that one of the techniques to solve the recurrence relation or guess the recurrence relation is by unfolding the definition. Right. So, uh, for example, we have looked at this second translation and we saw that Tn equals to 2n minus 1. Similarly, um, here is another one and we have seen how these second translations are solved. But then there are some recurrence translations for which we cannot solve it. For example, uh, Fibonacci number. The guessing of this solution is very hard. Similarly, if there are things like the uh, with floor and ceiling, guessing the, the recurrence relation is not easy because there doesn't exist any nice recurrence relation. So, in the last video lecture, what we saw was that maybe we can come up with some upper and lower bound. Now, so the upper and lower bound is something useful. For example, in this particular one, when we are looking at this Mars sort, we came up with an upper bound and lower bound for Mn, where the difference between upper bound and lower bound is not that much. It's a factor of 4. Now, of course, the question is that can we do better or do we even care to do better? Now this brings us to a problem of comparing solutions. Okay. So sometimes we are happy with just a multi constant multiplication gap between the upper and lower bounds. So when we compare functions, how do we compare? Now, for example, here is one example, right? So this was the case where mn equals 1 and mn equals 2 is given by this recurrence relation. And the question is that can we compare mn with n log n plus 2? Or in other words, we, what we got was that we could upper bound mn as 2 times n log n and lower bound by n over 2 or half of n log n. That's one kind of comparison. We face this kind of comparisons many times in our previous work. Another one is which number, which is bigger, n to the power 4 or 2 power n. Similarly, is n factorial and n power n similar? Or how about n square and n square minus n log n plus 100 n? So these are the kind of problems that we face all the time. We have to compare functions. And comparing functions 
is not necessarily there is a standard way of doing it. So till now we have seen a few techniques of comparing functions. So if we look at f and g as two functions from natural numbers to positive real numbers, then the first thing that comes in mind is we say f is equal to g if for all x f of x equals to f of g. This is the very nice way we want to do it, right? Second one is what we did for the case of this mn, which is f is less than or equal to g if for all x f of x is less than or equal to g of x. This can be written told in the other direction that g is bigger than or equal to f if g of x is greater than or equal to f of x, right? Now what happens if we are not worried about what the functions are behaving in initial stages? So in that case we should look at limit of f at x goes to infinity is are those two same? So limit of f as x goes to infinity and limit of x g as x goes to infinity is same. Or in other words, if for large enough x is f of x equals to g of x. Right? That is another way of comparing the functions. We, we say that okay, we don't care about what happens in the initial stages, but as x increases, then do they become same? The other one is, what about this kind of stuff? Say if f of x is equals to x is cube and g of x equals to x is cube plus minus 1 power x times x is square. So as you can see here that since x varies over all the natural numbers, so that means that for some x g of x is less than f of x, some x g of x is more than f of x. On the limit, they are not the same. But again, are they kind of similar or not? To formally put this one, we have to come up with some formal set of definitions. And this is what we call as asymptotic notations. So this is the first of the big asymptotic notations. And this is known as the big O notation. So if f and g are two functions, then we say f is O of g if there exists an n greater than or equal to 0 and some constant c and d such that for all x greater than or equal to n, f of x is less than c times g of x plus d. So in other words, what we are saying is that, what we are saying is that, basically for large enough x, f of x is upper bounded by some constant factor of g. So if you draw this graph here, the idea is that, sorry, if you draw this graph here and say this is g and this is f, now f can be d, can be small or something. But if you now consider this is g of x and this is f of x and if you think of some constant multiple, say this is a constant multiple, so c times g of x, as long as f of x is above this or below this red line, this line, we say f of x is bigger than g of x. In fact, we don't care what happens in the initial phase. For example, the blue line can be actually be like this, and that's also good enough for us. So we don't care some constant multiples of each other, but they are f of x is f is bounded by the constant times g of x for large enough x. And this is what we call as decode. 
So we will say f is equals to big O of g. That means f is smaller than some constant multiple of g. Okay. You should get familiar with this particular notation because this is something that is used all the time. In fact, in, B, in mathematics, this big O is describes the limiting behavior of a function where arguments tend to towards a particular value. Okay. A simple term. So, in fact, keeping with this mind, what we can say is that the mn that we were doing it earlier is big O of n log n. Because we have seen that mn is less than twice n log n for n greater than 5, right? So, this is what we have, okay? Now, just like big O, we have the opposite, like what happens in this relation, we say f is big O of g, the other way of writing it is g is big omega of s, okay? So, this is the same thing, just like when you say f is less than g, so this you can think of as f less than g and this is saying that g is greater than s, okay? Both of them are same term, in one case we use big O and the one can we use big omega. Now what happens if we if both of them are true? That means if f is big O of g and g is big O of s. So in other words, in this term f is something like less than constant sign g, which is less than some d times f. Or in other words, f is kind of sandwiched between two constants of g and g is sandwiched between two constants of f. Then we basically would like to say something like f is equal to g which is not true, correct, in general because we have this constant. So instead of that we have f is theta of g. So in our notation we have m of n therefore is equals to theta of n log n. So whenever if somebody says that some function is theta of some object, it means that it is kind of a, it is upper bounded and lower bounded by a constant of these terms. Okay, and this is what we kind of help us to um, to mathematically write down what we mean by uh, asymptotically this function is equal to this. Now there are two more, actually there are three more things. Something much more stronger than this particular theta is what is known as this sim notation and it's called asymptotically similar. So f of x and g of x are two numbers which are similar if limit as x tends to infinity f of x by g of x is 1. Now this is something useful. For example, we looked at x cube and x cube plus x square. Surprisingly enough, so these two are of course not equal, but they are similar. Why? Let's look at this one. This by x cube, x cube plus x square by x cube is basically 1 plus 1 over x. And when x goes to infinity, this becomes 0, so I get 1. So in other words, here we say that this and this are similar. The idea is that here, if you draw the, the plot of f of x and g of x, maybe they are something, they are slightly, they will be different for f and g, but as, as an, as x goes to infinity, these two converge to each other. So this is in some sense the most, the strongest that you can see, uh, strongest relation between two functions other than becoming exactly equal to each other. So we have big O, we have big omega, we have theta and we have C. There's two more things that we have. First of all is the small o. Small o is basically saying 
f x by g of x goes to 0. Means f x is significantly smaller than g of x. Okay, significantly smaller. And third one is there's the opposite of this, which is same. If f x is significantly smaller than g of x, we say g is small omega of f. Now you have to get familiar with these various notions, notations. The, the ideas are simple. They help us to kind of get a handle on various functions, help us to compare across functions, which is bigger, which is smaller. And it is useful remarkably for simplifying our mathematics. So I will give you some examples and I will ask you guys to solve them or prove them for yourselves. First of all, n cube is theta of n cube plus 1000 n square. In fact, when you have two polynomials and if their maximum degree are same, then they are theta of each other. In fact, I will say something more. If the maximum, the coefficient of maximum degree is same, then we have C. Okay, so C a cube is all same of C n cube plus D n square plus C n. So when we are looking at polynomials, then looking at the maximum degree is what matters. Okay. I would again ask you guys to prove them for yourselves, to prove, to convince yourselves that this is true. So if somebody tells, somebody says that okay, the running time of some of a function is n cube plus thousand n square, you can say it is theta of n square. Okay, similarly, n to the power four is mono of two power n. Meaning as n goes to infinity, n to the power four is way, way, way smaller than two power n. And in fact, any polynomial is small o of any exponential. So prove that. So n to the power 1000 is small o of 2 power square root n. Similarly, sorry, this should be something, there should be no zero here. But n square and log n square. is equals to small o of square root n. Again, poly log is small o of any polynomial. Now, these are the kind of very useful uh, things to keep in mind when you are looking at this, this set of small o, big o, theta notations. But then there are also other, couple of other formulas for which the sim is very useful and let me give you them ah oh, sorry so there's one more here then 2 power n is small o of 3 power n now regarding sim here are two very useful things first of all the n factorial now okay n factorial is a pretty weird object we don't know what we know what it means is n into n minus 1 into n minus 2 and so on but how does it compare with other functions? And we have what is known as the Stirling approximation, namely n factorial is asymptotically similar to square root 2 pi n times n by e power n. So as in other words, as n goes to infinity, then n factorial basically behaves like this. And this is very useful for us because this helps us to control or understand or compare it between functions. There is another one which is known as the prime number theorem. So the number of primes less than n is asymptotically similar to n by log n. So as n goes to infinity, the number of primes that is less than n is equals to n by log n. So this is actually log n basically. So 
This is kind of a um, language in mathematics that we have developed which helps us compare against uh, compare between functions when the functions are not exactly same or they're, they are, don't have a very clean representation to help us to compare between functions we use this set of notations these notations come again and again and again to simplify our mathematics in the next video we will see how we can use this particular notation to solve some of the recurrence relations. Thank you.